2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 5. Let's continue our series addressing the steps on the ladder of salvation. Verse number 5, are we there? It says, and beside this, Father in heaven, grant us now rich blessings is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Look with me. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 5. It says, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance and to temperance patience and to patience godliness. This is where we stopped the last time we met together. Godliness. Now this morning, this Sabbath, let's address the seventh step on the ladder of salvation, which is brotherly kindness. Verse number seven says, let's read together what it says. And to godliness, add what? Add brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, uh, charity. Let's take a look at the first phrase in verse number seven. And to godliness, brotherly what? Brotherly kindness. And this brotherly kindness is the seventh step on the ladder of salvation. And if I desire to be saved, I must ascend this seventh step on the ladder of salvation, which is brotherly kindness. I must manifest kindness to others. And if you desire to be saved, you must also ascend this seventh step on the ladder of salvation, namely kindness, you must be kind one to another. For without this brotherly kindness, none of us is going to be saved. And look with me again at verse 5 and verse number 6 of 2 Peter chapter 1. We find the first six steps are gifts from God. Is that clear, friends? Faith, number one. Virtue, number two. Let's go on. Then it says knowledge, temperance, temperance, patience, patience, godliness. All these first six steps on the ladder of salvation are gifts from God to us as we see our need. Therefore, the seventh step on the ladder of salvation, brotherly kindness, is also a gift from God. Is that clear so far? Because brotherly kindness is an attribute of the character of God, the character of Jesus Christ. I am born with a sinful nature. That means, naturally, I'm not kind. And if I am, I have ulterior motives. Naturally, I'm not kind. Naturally, I'm selfish. You are all born with a sinful nature. Therefore, naturally, you don't have brotherly kindness. Naturally, you are selfish. And if I remain selfish, I'm going to be lost. If you remain selfish, you're going to be lost. Therefore, all of us must ascend that seventh step on the ladder of salvation, which is brotherly kindness. Look with me again. I want you all to take your pencil or your writing instruments, and I want you to understand this. This ladder of salvation has eight steps. How many steps? Eight steps. And the first six, how many? The first six steps have everything to do with our relationship and Jesus Christ. Our, our connection with Jesus Christ. From faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness. All these six first steps connect us to Jesus Christ. And now number seven is how we relate to each other. Is that clear, friends? Do you see that? That's why you have seven steps so far. Why? The first six connect us with whom? Jesus Christ. And number seven is how we relate to whom? To each other. Hold your place in 2 Peter chapter 1. And look with me at Matthew chapter 22. Where are we going to, my friends? Matthew chapter 22. This is what Christ says in verse 36 through verse number 40. Jesus says... These are the two principles that cover the Ten Commandments. Number one, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. Then he says now, and thy neighbor as thyself. Is that clear, friends? So now, if I profess 
to be a Christian. If I profess to be Christ-like, then I must also manifest brotherly kindness to other people. If that is clear, say amen, friends. So if you profess to be a Christian, if you are professed to be Christians, then what must you manifest to others and demonstrate this is brotherly kindness? It's the seventh step on the ladder of salvation. Unless we are connected to Christ, on those first six steps, we can never demonstrate brotherly kindness to each other. And this is what Christ says in John chapter 13. Let's go there. Close Matthew 22. Let's turn our Bibles to John chapter 13. Where are we going to, my friends? John chapter 13. And look with me at verse number 35. Read that with me. I could have quoted it. But I want us to read this together. What does it say, friends, in verse 35? Come on, what it says. What? Well, well, go back, amen, go back to verse 34, a new what? Commandment, instruction. I give unto you that you what? Have love one, that you love each other as I have what? Loved you. Verse 34, by this shall all men know that you are what? My disciples, if you have what? Love for whom? Do you see it, friends? So as we ascend the first six steps, from faith all the way up to godliness. If we profess to be Christ-like, if we profess to be a Christian, if we profess to have God-like characteristics, it is demonstrated by how we treat each other. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you are Christians, if you have love for each other, brotherly kindness. I want to share with you something, friends. Because naturally, I am selfish. Naturally, you are selfish. Is there any selfish person going to be in heaven? No. That means I must become converted. You must also become converted. Look with me. Let's turn our Bibles to Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. Where are we going to? Colossians chapter 3. So I must see my need daily to receive brotherly kindness because naturally I lack it. And this is the seventh step on the ladder of salvation. And without it, I am lost. You must also see your need for brotherly kindness and to manifest it because this is the seventh step on the ladder of salvation, and without it, we are going to be lost. Do you see your need? Look with me. Colossians chapter 3. Are we there, my friends? Verse number 7 speaks of the man who is unconverted. It says, let's read, come on, let's go together. Verse 7, what it says? Into which you also walked sometime when you lived in them, but now you also put off all these. What are these things? Anger, wrath, Malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Skip on down to verse 10. What must we put on? The new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. And verse number 12 is key. Listen to what it says. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, what must we put on? Bowels of mercies, and what's the next one in the list? Kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and what? Long-suffering. So only those who have on the new man can demonstrate brotherly kindness. Only if I ascend the first six steps of the ladder of salvation, and number six is godliness, becoming converted, will I be able to demonstrate brotherly kindness to others. It's only as you see a need of Christ's character, Christ's godliness, will you be able to demonstrate and manifest brotherly kindness to others. I want to share with you what God shared with me. Brotherly kindness, it is not just a theory. Brotherly kindness, all throughout Scripture, is primarily connected to forgiveness. Hmm. So when God says uh, the seventh step 
on the ladder of salvation is brotherly kindness, which is connected to forgiving other people. That means if we do not forgive others, we will not be saved. And God is saying it's not by accident. Brotherly kindness is the seventh step on the ladder of salvation. For what does seven represent in the Bible? Oh, <laughs> completion. So if I profess to be godly, profess to be a disciple, profess to be a Christian, but I do not forgive others, my character will not be perfected. The seventh step. If you are professed to be Christians, professed to be godly, and yet you refuse to forgive others, your characters will not be perfected and you will be lost. I see my need. Look at me. Do you see your need? Go with me. Skip on down to verse 13. We just read verse 12 of Colossians chapter 3. It says, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of what? Mercies and kindness. Skip on down to verse 13. For, let's read, come on, what it says. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. So what is connected to putting on mercies and kindness? Forgiveness. And notice, it didn't say beer kindness. No. Put it on. Because in a spiritual context, I am not born with kindness, an attribute of God's character. You aren't born with kindness, an attribute of God's character. I must see my need for it. You must see your need for it. And as we all see our need for it, as we ask, Christ will give it unto us, then we can put it on. And once Christ tells me to put something on that is, is essential for my salvation, he expects me to keep it on. Amen. And Christ expects you to receive it and to retain it. Close Colossians chapter 3. Look with me. Ephesians chapter 4. Where are we going to, my friends? Beloved, I like when the Lord challenges me. Because if God does not instruct and rebuke and reprove me, I would think I am okay. And if God's word doesn't challenge you, reprove you, rebuke you, you will all think that you are okay. And if any one of us sits here and thinks that we are okay, we are in the danger zone. Chapter 4 of Ephesians. Are we there, my friends? Father in heaven. The seventh step on this ladder of salvation, educate us, reprove us, instruct us, and encourage us, we pray, in Christ's name. Look with me. Chapter 4, are we there, my friends? Verse number 31, it says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and all evil speaking be put away from you with all what? With all malice, notice now, and be you kind. One to another, tender-hearted, and what is connected to kindness again? It says, uh, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. So now, what is that seventh step on the ladder of salvation? Brotherly kindness. And what does number seven typify in Bible prophecy and Bible numerology? It means completion. It means perfection. In six days, God made everything. And what? Rested on the seventh. It, he said it's finished. It's completed. It's done. Number seven. If we profess to be Christians, and yet we refuse to be kind and to forgive others, our characters will not be perfected. If that's clear, say amen. amen. However, God shows me. In the fourth chapter of Ephesians, if I see my need of his attribute of character, namely brotherly kindness, 
which is akin to forgiving other people. Then he says, as I demonstrate brotherly kindness, forgiving others, I then become a candidate to be sealed, to be saved by God. This promise is also for you. If you receive it, brotherly kindness, and forgive others, you also become candidates to be sealed and to be saved by God. I want to be sealed and saved. How about you, friends? Look with me. Verse 30. Ephesians chapter 4. Verse number 30. Are we there, my friends? It says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are what? What is the context of this? Whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all what now? Bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be you what? Kind one to another. Tender hearted. Forgiving one another. Why? For God, for Christ's sake, has also what? Forgiving you, friend, forgiven you. Is this clear to you, friends? Or am I talking to myself? Do I see my need? Do you see your need for it, friends? We have to ascend this ladder of salvation. And number seven, it's brotherly kindness. Let's go again. Add to godliness what? Friends, this, this, this lesson has multiple layers of truth. All right? So please, Father in heaven, grant us inspiration, we pray. In Christ's name, listen to me now. Watch what it says from God's Holy Spirit. And to godliness, what? Brotherly kindness. Forgiving other people. If that's clear, my friends, say amen. Now, write this down beside 2 Peter chapter 1. Go back there with me. And put this in your notepaper, in your notebook. Look with me. 2 Peter chapter 1. And look with me, verse number 7. Friends, every nugget I give you from God, take note. Watch this, verse 7. And to godliness, add what? Brotherly kindness. Circle those two words, brotherly kindness, and write down the word Philadelphia. I got very curious. I took up my Strong's Concordance. I looked up that word kindness. And that word kindness... The original word for kindness, it means Philadelphia. That's why it is called brotherly kindness. Yes, Philadelphia, the city there in Pennsylvania. Philadelphia, add to godliness. What, my friends? Brotherly kindness. And what does brotherly kindness mean? It means Philadelphia, forgiving your brother, forgiving your sister, Philadelphia, but let's go deeper. You ready, friends? Does Christ send a message to the church of Philadelphia? Ah, one more layer now. So add to godliness the message Christ sends to the church of Philadelphia. And that's kindness. Is that clear? So now, question for you. Where do we find the message to the church of Philadelphia. Let's turn there. Hold your place in 2 Peter chapter 1. Let's go in our Bibles to Revelation chapter 3. So when Christ gives up the heavenly manna from heaven's bakery, let's not think that we know everything. Amen, friends? Watch chapter 3 of Revelation. Just note these verses. Verse 7 and verse number 8. Verse 7 speaks of the church in Philadelphia. And verse 8, Jesus says, I have said before thee an open door. So now, add to godliness, brotherly kindness. Add to godliness the message to the church of Philadelphia. And what does Christ set before the church of Philadelphia? He says what? I have set before thee an open door. Where is that open door? It's in the heavenly sanctuary. But based on this scripture, which door is this? Where is Christ right now, friends? He's in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. The seventh step on the ladder of salvation also points to evangelism. 
You see it now? Add to godliness, brotherly kindness, the message to Philadelphia. I have set before thee an open door, the message of the open door in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Talk to me now. What work is Christ now conducting within the open door in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary? What is that work? You got it. The work of investigative uh, judgment. And we are specifically in the book of the Revelation, do we find the message regarding the investigative judgment? Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 through verse number 12. Let's go again. So add to godliness what? Brotherly kindness. The root word is Philadelphia. So now, if we profess to be Christ-like, what message must we receive and give to the world? The three angels messages the open door of salvation the open door of the work of christ the work of investigative judgment so when pastors among this denomination say the three angels messages are not important for us it shows they don't have brotherly kindness when they say there's no such thing as an investigative judgment, when they discard October 22nd, 1844, it means they don't have brotherly kindness from God. They are not on the seventh step on the ladder of salvation. Their characters cannot be perfected. In these last days, it is the three angels' messages that Christ has sent to perfect our characters because the next verses say, verse 14 through verse 16, the harvest of the earth is ripe. The seventh step on the ladder of salvation, Philadelphia, the open door, but my friends, that door would not be open forever. And this is what Christ is saying to me, Andrew, this open door will not remain so forever. Ascend the seventh step of the ladder of salvation. And God is saying the same thing to you. Amen. Oh, yes. That open door will be shut one day. Was there an open door in the days of Noah? Was it shut one day? Was there an open door in the days of Lot? The angels put Lot in and shut the door. Then probation began to close individually by family until the general close of probation. Fire and brimstone is the word today as it was in the days of Lot. The door is shutting. Add to godliness, brotherly kindness, the message to Philadelphia, the open door, it is shutting. I see my need to quickly come up the first six steps on the ladder of salvation and say, dear God, plant my feet on number seven. Brotherly kindness. First, being converted, giving out this experience. Look with me at Matthew chapter six. Go there with me. Where are we going to, my friends? Because, my friends, events are now transpiring, showing us the door of mercy is shutting. That open door, it is shutting. The mark of the beast is about to be enforced. The second coming of Christ, it is even at the doors. And guess what? When the mark of the beast is enforced, persecution comes for God's commandment-keeping people. Hear me now. Let's connect these dots. And once we are being persecuted verbally and physically, we must manifest brotherly kindness. We must even forgive those who are persecuting us. Do you see the connection now, friends? For what did Stephen pray when they were stoning Stephen? 
Oh, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Close Matthew chapter 6. As a matter of fact, what does verse 12 say of Matthew 6? Come on, what it says here, friends? It says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive whom? Our, this is brotherly kindness. And the Bible tells us in the 13th chapter of the Revelation, go there with me, chapter 13, the Revelation. Look with me at verse number 3. Verse number 3, note these verses. Verse number 3 and verse number 12, Father in heaven, Dear God, I pray, grab our attention. Help us to realize that door is shutting the door of salvation. The mark of the beast is about to be enforced. We have nothing to fear if we're on the steps of the ladder, going onward and upward. But we have much to fear if we're going downward into sin. Oh, dear God, awaken us, we pray, in Christ's name. Look with me. Where are we going to, friends? Chapter 13, verse number 3, it speaks about the papacy, popery, the leopard-like beast, that this power will receive a deadly wound. Amen? But verse number 12 says that deadly wound will one day be healed. Hear me. When the papacy in 1798 received its deadly wound, she lost her control over the churches and over the countries, the nations, the states. So now, if we are now seeing Pope even Pope Francis is now regaining influence and control over various churches and religions. What does that mean? The wound is about to be healed. And when the wound is healed, what will happen to God's commandment keeping people? Persecution. And how must we react when being persecuted? We must have brotherly kindness, which means what? We must forgive even those who are persecuting us. Is this clear, friends? Look here. This is January 25th, 2016. Headline says, listen carefully. It says, he appealed for forgiveness for the sin of our divisions. Notice now how he describes divisions. He says, he appealed for forgiveness for the sin of our divisions. And what, friends? An open wound in the body of Christ. Hear me carefully. You might say that is just for the Lutherans and the Catholics, but not so. The very next sentence, the Pope says, this is not just for Lutherans, but for every other church. We must all unite to heal the wound. What wound is this, friends? It says, he added that, when together, the Christians of what? Different churches listen to the word of God and try to put it in practice. They achieve important what? Steps toward unity. But can two walk together? Except they be agreed. And just as inspiration prophesied, that this will take place, it is now taking place. Look at this, great controversy. Page 444 says, the churches will unite and they will lay aside their different points of doctrine. Look at this. It says, watch, the service includes five commitments for Catholics and Lutherans together. Catholics and Lutherans, let's read, should always begin from the perspective of what? Unity. And not from the point of view of division. In order to strengthen what is held in common. So are they laying aside their doctrinal differences? Are they now uniting? So what does this mean? Is the wound about to be healed? Now friends, on whose terms are they now uniting? 
the various Protestant churches and the papacy, not on the terms of Protestantism, but on the terms of popery. Come on, let me make sure you're with me. What says the fifth commandment based on Scripture? Honor thy father and mother. What says the sixth commandment based on Scripture? Come on. Oh, boy. <laughs> what if this was our passport to go to heaven? <laughs> Would you make it in? <laughs> the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. What's number seven? Thou shalt not commit adultery. What's number eight? Thou shalt not steal. What's number nine? Based on Scripture, thou shalt not bear false witness. What's number ten? Thou shalt not covet. But listen now, this is the document that the Protestants and the Catholics put together for unity, but on whose terms? Look at this. It says the service has readings. From what? The report from conflict to what now? Communion. No more dissension, let's all unite. Listen, it says they repeatedly, what? Violated the Eighth Commandment, which prohibits bearing false witness against one another. Is that the Eighth Commandment based on Scripture? So what's going on here, friends? Let's all the churches unite with Pope, but on whose terms? On whose terms? Notice now, and the Pope is saying, I want all Protestant churches to what? Forgive Pope. Forgive the papacy for persecuting them. Hear me now. Did God's word say Pope would do this? Will apologize for persecuting God's people? Did God's word say, Pope will ask for others to forgive them? It's right here in Great Controversy, page 571. But let's pause here for a minute. So now, since God's word say this will take place, it's now taking place. Do you not believe God's word? Do you not believe that Sister Ellen G. White and her writings were all inspired by God? And God says, even when the papacy asks for forgiveness, the papacy has not changed. Hear me now. So now, for Pope Francis and Pope to say, churches, forgive us. That means they did something wrong. Is that clear, friends? That's easy. One plus one equals two. Amen. But the statements of the Roman Catholic Church says that Pope the Catholic Church uh, have never erred and will never err. Wait a minute. So what does this mean then for the Pope to be saying, forgive us, we apologize? It sounds as if it is uh, conflicting. But the Pope is making these statements. Uh, these statements are deceptive. He wants to get on vantage ground to regain control of the various churches. Look here, friends. It says, watch, it says, uh, GC 564, it says right here, as Rome asserts, let's read, that the church uh, never erred, nor will it, according to the scriptures, uh, ever err. How can she renounce the principles which governed her course in past ages, uh, all that she, Pope, has done in her persecution of those who reject her dogmas, she holds to be what? To be right. Let the restraints now imposed by secular governments be removed and Rome be reinstated in her former power. And what, friends? And there would speedily be a revival of her tyranny and persecution. Let me ask you a question. Is the papacy ascending to world dominance as she was in the dark ages? Yeah. So what's coming, friends? For God's commandment keeping people. So the question is, are we on that seventh step of the ladder of salvation? 
Because we must demonstrate brotherly kindness. We must ask God even to forgive those who spit in our faces. Mm. Even those who crucify us. It's coming, my friends. Just some urgency. And guess what? He's not letting up. He's going with lightning speed. Look at this. Crocs covering all things Catholic says. Why Pope Francis' push for unity is going how? Going how, friends? He's going into overdrive. Unity? And he says this unity is necessary to bring about the healing of the wound. And the, this says he's moving with rapid pace in overdrive. Yet God's people are at ease in Zion. There's no urgency in our churches. The professors in our seminaries are teaching smooth things. Abominable doctrines, heresies. While probation's hour is fast closing, why the Pope's agenda for unity is going into overdrive. And God's word says, final movements shall be what? Rapid ones, my friends. And guess what? The Pope, he's not only addressing the adults or the youth, even the children. Watch this. Catholic New Service. Headline, simple, not silly. Children's questions become what? Book by whom? A book by Pope Francis, January 28, 2016. This week, the books to now deceive even our children is a moving with rapid pace. Look at this. Do you remember when he said these words? He says... That Jesus had to beg forgiveness from Mary? Yes. Hmm, friends? Right here. He says, watch. He says, uh, Mary and Joseph were unable to find Jesus. For this little escapade, Jesus probably had to beg forgiveness of his parents. If Christ had to beg forgiveness from Mary, what does that mean? Christ sinned. He says, uh, the gospel, the Pope speaking, the gospel doesn't say this, but I believe that we can presume it. But listen to this. He says this. If you're sick and you doubt God's love, you can pray to Mary. He says, uh, Catholic News Agency, just two days ago, it says, uh, Pope speaking, ask Mary's help. If illness makes it hard for you to trust God's mercy, Pope Francis advises. How can we call then the papacy a Christian organization? When he's implying that God is some barbaric person. If you doubt God's mercy, you can pray to Mary. But friends, Mary is dead. And the dead know not anything. And Mary is in the tomb, in the grave, waiting for the second advent of Jesus. So now, when the Pope says, you can pray to Mary, which Mary is this? It's a demon called Mary. It's idolatry. And you call this a Christian organization? Listen now. And then they're saying, let us lay aside our doctrinal differences. Let's all unite with the Pope, with Pope Will you unite, friends? Does God want us to unite with this power? And the majority of the Christian denominations, the Baptists, the Lutherans, Church of God, Presbyterians, Methodists, all of them receive their dogmas, some doctrine from the Roman Catholic Church. That's heavy, I know. I know. Visitors, I know it's heavy. 
And that's why God in his love is calling you from darkness into his marvelous light. But now let's make a personal application because as Satan is working, in the various churches, lay aside your doctrines, biblical doctrines. Let's all unite. Hear me now, friends. The same thing is going on in our homes. Because many of us compromise with our children. So we are laying aside biblical principles in order to make our children believe that we love them. While we are leading them into sin. By our selfish actions, we are compromising. It's going on in marriages. Wow. Compromise. So don't say, oh, that's going on just in the world. No, it's going on in many of the homes in Christendom. Laying aside biblical principles just to be in harmony. I just want love in my home. I just want peace in my home, and yet we are compromising, friends. Hear me now, hear me now. Someone may say, well, pastor, if I don't compromise, there's going to be war. <laughs> war! But guess what? It's that very controversy that is to build your character. Amen. Oh, you feel uneasy now. Oh, pastor, please qualify that statement, pastor. Qualify it. No, take it to prayer. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. Notice now, friends, that means the Pope of Rome also has his counterfeit brotherly kindness. Please forgive the Catholic Church. Oh, you don't see it. Do you see it, my friends? The Pope also has his counterfeit brotherly kindness because brotherly kindness is connected to forgiving others. Do you see it now, friends? The counterfeit. And Christ's brotherly kindness, forgiving others, is connected to the message to the church of Philadelphia. I have set before thee an open door. Is the Pope also counterfeiting Christ's open door? He says, in this year of jubilee, I'm going to open a door. Do you see it, my friend, the man of sin? Everything Christ does, he counterfeits. Then he says, listen, then he says, right here, he says, if you do not unite with us to care for the poor, you are going to burn in hell. Watch this. He says, watch carefully, Pope to the proud and powerful. Let's read what he says. Help the poor or you will want go to hell. Wait a minute, dear friends. Wait a minute. Then he says, red words. It's only through what? Works of mercy that the powerful and wealthy can be embraced and loved by Jesus. Is that biblical? Oh, my friends. And yet everybody calls this entity a Christian entity. If you don't unite with us and care for the poor, you will go to hell. What does the Pope say is the primary thing every nation must enforce in order to care for the poor? Sunday observance. He says, watch, and so, the last sentence, and so, the day of rest, Sunday, centered on the Eucharist, sheds its light on the whole week and motivates us to greater concern for nature and the poor. What is he now saying then, friends? If we do not honor Sunday when it becomes law, we go to hell. And the implication is he will bring hell to us on this earth by the medium of persecution. Is the mark of the beast near, my friends? Now, if you had an, an, an opportunity to tell the world what the mark of the beast is, would you be silent? 
Would you be silent? What if someone asks you, what is the mark of the beast? Would you be silent? What if someone asks you that on primetime television? What is the mark of the beast? Would you be silent? Look at this. January 27, 2016, Faith of the Candidates, an interview with Ben Carson, a Seventh-day Adventist. Must I go on? It says, and this saddens me, the interviewer says, uh, one more question. What? Related to Seventh-day Adventist theology. Some would call Sunday keeping the mark of the beast. I have seen you, Ben Carson, in your history, go back and forth between different churches. Carson responded, I preached at a church yesterday, River of Life Church in Cedar Rapids. Interviewer, so what do you think about Sunday keepers? Carson, he says, I would say most of my best friends are Sunday keepers. I don't see any mark on them. They are good people. Just to get into the office of the presidency, he is, uh, oh friends, oh beloved, S sold out? Well, it saddens my heart. He's compromising God's truth. Notice now, he was asked the question. Now we know, we know that Sunday right now is not the mark of the beast. But when it becomes the law of the lands, the countries, and the man had the opportunity to say so and didn't say so, do you know why I know? I want to ask you a question. If you were asked on primetime TV, is Sister Ellen G. White and her writings inspired by God, what would you say? Yes. What would you say? If someone asked you, does Sister Ellen G. what had the same inspiration as Andrew Henriquez who preached God's word, what would you say? Okay, does Sister Ellen White have the same inspiration as, or let me say it this way, does Franklin Graham, does Billy Graham, is he inspired like Ellen White? Watch this. Who is this? Ben Carson. The interviewer says, so was Ellen White a unique prophet for our day? Or was she one of many who wrote good, helpful things under the inspiration of God? Carson said, I would seriously doubt that Ellen White would be the only person who would be inspired by God. The interviewer asks, is she unique as a prophet today? He says, I doubt that. Listen. And the interviewer didn't let him off the hook. Interviewer says, second line, did Ellen White have a unique prophetic role? Or one of many who might have a similar prophetic role? Carson says in response, I can't believe that there would only be one prophet. What is that, my friends? At such a time in history, the man is compromising. Now, if somebody was to ask Mormons, do you believe Joseph Smith, the founder of your church, met with Gabriel? From heaven, what would they say on prime time television? Yes. Yet, yet he's a false prophet. Listen, interviewer, is there anyone you look to today who you might say there is a, a similar spirit of prophecy on that person? Carson said, I think there are a lot of people out there today in the spiritual world that I respect tremendously who have provided extraordinarily wise counsel. This saddens me, my friends. 
And we are told that this is not singular just to Ben Carson. Because many Seventh-day Adventists believe just the same as he believes. A crisis in our church, my friends. Yet the Bible says the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God. And what, friends? And the testimony of Jesus Christ, the commandments and the spirit of prophecy. And what two points was he challenged on? The Sabbath, mark of the beast, and the spirit of prophecy, and he's failing now. And guess what? I'm sad, friends. And guess what? We can say, oh, poor Ben Carson. Let's pray for him. Pray for yourself. Amen. Don't weep for him. Weep for yourself. Why? The test is coming to me. The test is coming to you. What are you going to do in this hour of crisis when you are placed on the spot before the world? These people are troublemakers. They don't want to unite with the rest of the churches. They must be fined, imprisoned, be put to death. What will I do? What will you do? Father in heaven, awaken us, dear God. And that's why I am sad by this. Because many don't even know the hour is very, very late. And when Christ was persecuted, even on the cross, about to die, Christ being crucified, what was Christ's prayer, friends? Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do, that Christ manifests brotherly kindness on the cross of Calvary while he was being persecuted, forgiving them of their ignorance while they were persecuting him. Look at Luke 6 with me, friends. Lord, Lord, Lord. Are we ready for this, friends? You ask me, why talk about current events? How many of you profess to be seven-day Adventist Christians? Raise your hand. What does Adventist mean, friends? In the context, the coming of Jesus. And what shows us how close he is to return. The signs of the times. So when I hear people say things and send me emails, Pastor, why talk about prophecy so much? Yet they profess to be Adventists. They are not Adventist, friends. They just don't love the coming of Jesus. Luke chapter 6, do you love his coming, friends? Amen. Then you will love prophecy. It shows us how close we are. It gives us urgency and say, look, the time is so close, Andrew. Do you have the experience to go through these last days? Are you on that seventh step on the ladder? The crisis is so close, safe to serve local. It's so close, safe to serve international. And the question is, are you ascending that seventh step on the ladder of salvation? Namely, brotherly kindness, forgiving even those who you think do not deserve forgiveness. Look at this. Luke, what chapter, my friends? We must see our need. I see mine. Do you see yours? Luke chapter 6. So who will you vote for? Come November. You better vote for Jesus. Amen. Luke chapter 6. Are we there, my friends? Verse number 35. What it says here, friends. It says, together what it says. But love you your enemies. And do good and lend hoping. Are we there? Hoping for what? Nothing. And your reward shall be great, and you shall be the children of the highest. For Jesus is kind unto whom the unthankful and to whom the evil. So who is Christ kind to, friends? 
He's kind to the unthankful, those who do not deserve his kindness. And I must be like Christ. What's that sixth step on the ladder of salvation called? It's called godliness. If I profess to be Christ-like, I must be kind even to those who don't deserve it. If you profess to be kind, if you profess to be godly, you must be forgiving to others. Oh, my friends. Skip on down to verse 37. He says, but judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not and you shall not be condemned. And what is the next phrase? Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. I was wrestling with God this morning. I said, Lord, why is the seventh step on the ladder called brotherly kindness? Forgiveness, why is this number seven? Of course, I told you earlier, God told me, it's for character building. And the only way I can demonstrate brotherly kindness, forgiving others, Christ must place me in circumstances where people despise me, persecute me, so then I can demonstrate brotherly kindness. I can demonstrate forgiveness. Yes. Have you ever gone through hurt? How many of us here can say, nobody has ever hurt me on this earth? Whether emotionally, verbally, or physically. Who can say such, friends? Do you know right now, some of us, if not all, we are holding on to unforgiveness? And if this is the case, we are not on that seventh step on the ladder of salvation. Forgiveness is number seven, perfection of character. It's personal for me, friends. I had to wrestle with God. I said, Lord, is there anyone in my life I've not yet forgiven? You wouldn't believe me, friends, who God showed me. I can't tell you. <laughs> How many of you have ever been in a situation where a family member just acted as if you never existed. How did you feel, friends? Hmm? How, how did you feel? Is there one? Is there one witness, friends? I grew up in a home. Father was there as if he wasn't there, friends. Now, some of you don't even know what I'm talking about because you had the privilege of having mom and dad every day in your presence, but not me. And that is one reason why I turned to the streets the moment I had the opportunity. And for years, I didn't even realize this was paining me. No father, having only once my father ever took me out of somewhere. Only once. Only once. Only once. Now you cannot relate to that. Only Jesus. And there's somebody here, maybe you have been raped, molested. Do you know you, you cannot be saved if you're holding on to unforgiveness? Abused? If you're holding on to unforgiveness, you're not going to make it. Maybe you have uh, been forced to have an abortion. And you have not yet forgiven that man or, or that parent. You were forced on forgiveness. You're not going to make it. Not going to make it. So praise God. Jesus wants to release us today. Amen. You may have been and still are in a marriage relationship being abused. A husband walked out on you. Or a wife forsook you, leaving you with the children. And for years, for months, you have been holding on to malice and grudge and unforgiveness. While you are professing to be a Christian, you're not going to make it. God is saying to me, you have to give it up and do it now. 
That door is closing. Do it now. For years, friends. And guess what? I was trying not to think about him. Because every time I thought about what my life could have been with a father in the home, it hurt. For months, for years, I carried that pain, friends. Until one day it hit me. He was not Christian. So I'm asking him to do what he can do. That's it, friends. That's why Jesus and Stephen, leave Stephen alone. That's what Jesus could say on the cross now. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He was not Christian. And he's born with a sinful nature. Friends, I'm not equating this if you have gone through something you think is worse. But how dare you say yours was worse? You were never in my shoe. I would never be in my shoe. But God is saying, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Just forgive. And guess what? He, never, he has never come to me and say, I'm sorry. But guess what? The forgiveness is already there. Amen. And this is what Christ is showing me and showing you. Because many times we say, yes, I understand that. I must forgive. When they come to me, then I forgive them. No, 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 friends. No, no, no. Christ doesn't wait for us to come to offer forgiveness. He died on the cross. Salvation, pardon, forgiveness for everyone. But Christ put it in the bank. It's not yours yet. <laughs> no. But when you see your need of it, you come to him now. You surrender now. It's applied to your account. But it's already there waiting for you, friends. And if you never come, it's still there. But now it's unused for your account. That's the gospel, my friends. So now, if I profess to be a Christian, I mustn't wait until he or she comes and say, please forgive me, then I will forgive. And all throughout, I'm holding on to grudge and malice. I'm just as a devil as I say they are. I'm no better than they are. The seventh step on the ladder of salvation. To perfect your character. Nobody's going to be saved. Without manifesting. Hear me, hear me, hear me. Brotherly kindness. Forgiving even those who don't deserve forgiveness. So what if somebody has said this about you? So what, friends? If we can handle it now... When are we going to handle it? And let me tell you something. It doesn't mean if somebody says, forgive me, I'm sorry, that that person must be reinstated to where they were. Because the nature of some sins may bar that person from being placed back in that original position. For some sins, false can be reinstated. We can forgive, but that doesn't mean you put them back and make yourself vulnerable. For example, my friends, if your daughter was molested by an uncle, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If your son was molested by an uncle, could you forgive? Mercy. No, that's your brother now. Could you forgive? Oh, my Lord. Could you forgive? But you have to forgive. And what must you do practically so you can forgive? It's by beholding Jesus. Forgive even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. It's a daily experience, friends. Hear me now. But does that mean with that sin... You are forgiven, you take your son and put back your son in the care of the same uncle. But what if he's baptized? 
<laughs> bring that in your closet in prayer. <laughs> but it's serious, friends. And this is one reason why the apostle Paul, who was once Saul, became the apostle to whom? The Gentiles and not to the Jews. The Jews, many of them, could not come to the point to trust Paul. Yet Paul sat at the feet of the rabbis. Couldn't trust him, friends. But the man was converted. David, was he not converted? Yet David could not build that temple. Do you see what I'm saying here, friends? But some of us think we can make it into God's kingdom holding on to unforgiveness. You did so and so. You did so and so. You did so and so. Has a friend ever hurt you before, friends? And guess what? A stranger can never hurt you as a friend can. Because the friend knows your secrets. They know you when you're up, when you're down. They know your history. And when a friend turns on you, friends, that's like fire scorching your skin. But guess what? You have to still forgive. May I say this now? And even be brought to the point in which you forget. I can see my mother right there in my view, friends. This, this so-called friend from South Florida claiming to be a pastor, walking around. And friends, hear me. If you are going to destroy someone's character, just be wise and do it in secret. <laughs> Knowing you're going to hell if you don't repent. Why did publicly? Folks from Trinidad from South Florida, from Bermuda. Even some of you here have heard this guy calling my name. Everywhere he goes, he's calling my name. Telling people, stay away from Pastor Henriquez. He is of the devil. And had the audacity to be saying he was in my wedding. Which he wasn't. And how would these folks know? You mean folks from the Caribbean? From America, even from England calling me? Do you know so-and-so? And the flesh says, how, how dare you do so, such thing? But I have to forgive. Yes. And even when I see, if I should see him, be kind. Yes. But I must not make myself vulnerable. Yes. Give cold water to your enemy. You heap coals upon their heads. And it's Jesus who will light it. Not us, friends. He will light it, not us. And then he came back and now calling my mother. Friends, I know what I'm talking about. Trying to fish to see what Andrew's doing. And telling lies. I call him all the time, but don't get him. My number has not changed since 2001. My same number, friends. Everybody else can call, but when you so-called call, you can't get me? Until my mother had to say, hey, stop calling me. If you want to speak to Andrew and to know about Andrew, you have his number, call him. He hasn't called back since. And the flesh is now rising up. Hate him. Malice him. No, I'm going to love him still. I know what I'm talking about, friends. Thou shalt not kill, not physically, but destroying someone's character. How many of your family members, friends, who do such things to you? And bring division in your home. You have to give it up. Have you ever seen a bloated balloon? You open it. God wants to release us today, friends. The ear of sin and unforgiveness. Have to release that. Until you come to the point in which when you see the person, there's no hatred in your heart. No hatred, friends. Listen, until you can forgive and forget. I was driving here, Christian Hillary. We're all talking in the car about forgiveness. 
And I had to remind Hillary, how many times have you said, do you remember what so-and-so did? You know, sometimes wives. It takes a little longer <laughs> for wives to kind of give it. But they do, praise God. Amen. They do. How many times she would say, so-and-so. I said, yeah, I've forgotten that. Because I don't have time to be replaying. And some of us, we are very, we have a brain that has play and rewind. Play. It's never fast forward. It's play, rewind, and the pause button. And record. And we can sit there and replay whatever the person said with the right tone. And press pause and we splice the words and we analyze and we say, oh, how could she do so and so? And yes, it becomes harder for us to forgive. Stop replaying, friends. Hit fast forward and then hit eject. Boom. <laughs> we have to get victory. The seventh step on the ladder. Do you know for how many times phone calls come into me, Pastor? My husband just divorced me. I don't know, I don't know if I can forgive him. I don't know. And the only thing I can do is to share my testimony. My testimony is similar. And these scriptures, these words gave me encouragement. And Christ has given me victory. It is a daily experience. Even when I see the person, hear from the person, self does not rise up. Christ says, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he was threatened, he, when he was suffered, he did not retaliate, but he gave everything to his Father who judgeth righteously. Judgment day is coming, my friends. And I do not want to be on the outside looking in. I want to be on the inside. What do you want to be, my friends? So what step must we be on? Father in heaven, grab hold of our minds. What step must we be on? Ascending step number seven. If we profess to be a Christian, look with me. Proverbs 31. Where are we going to, my friends? Proverbs 31. And parents, if your children hear you malign someone's character, what can you expect of them? They are going to hold on to unforgiveness still. And hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me. Hear me, Father, help us here. This is why it is dangerous. For example, if there are issues going on in your marriage, don't tell somebody else. Hear me, for example, a day will come you and your husband, you and your wife will make it up and lay aside differences. But because you sowed that negative seed in your best friend's mind, when your spouse should be your best friend. Because you sowed that seed in a church brother's mind about your wife, a church sister's mind about your husband. You and your spouse have moved along, but not that brother. Not that sister. He or she holds that sin against your spouse forever. Dangerous, my friends. That's why we are told that if pride and selfishness were laid aside, five minutes would solve many marital problems. Early writings 118. Look with me. Proverbs 31. Oh, beloved, is God talking to us, friends? I'm telling you, it's personal. I can share what God is not doing for me. Verse 26, are we there? It says, are we there, friends? It says, this is the virtuous woman. And who does a woman typify in the scriptures? The church. So what we read here must be our experience. Proverbs 31, verse 26, it says, she openeth her what? Her mouth with wisdom and in her tongue is what? Is the law of kindness. So what is in the mouth of God's church? The law of what? Of kindness. Look here, friends, as we close. It says, uh, Testaments, Volume 3, 
page 108 says uh, duty. Let's read. Duty. Stern duty has a twin sister which is a kindness. And what is that seventh step on the ladder of salvation? Kindness, it says duty. God's standards, God's law, duty, stern duty has a twin sister which is kindness. If duty and kindness are what? Blended. Decided advantage will be gained. But if duty is separated from kindness, if tender love is not mingled with duty, there will be a failure and much harm will be the result. Men and women will not be driven, but many can be won by what? Kindness and love. When I read this right there in, in awkward, I, Lord help me, because I by nature is very firm. In my home, I crack the whip. <laughs> Lord have mercy. See, I told you, he abused his, his family. No. <laughs> but I have to be that authoritarian figure. Standard. Why do you think when a baby borns, he or she can tell who the, the man is? <laughs> you know what I'm saying, friends. But if all I demonstrate in my home is law, 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 duty, duty and sternness and no kindness, I'm unconverted. And I will be driving the family and not leading the family. You're not hearing me? The seventh step on the ladder of salvation. Why? We have many so-called present truth believers. Seventh-day Adventists, even Christians. Men say, I'm the man of this home. I run this place. It's all about law, but no kindness. Yet when I see Jesus, oh, do you see it now? I see law, and I see what? Kindness. I must see Jesus. And listen to me. One day I looked at Christian, I said, Lord, if I don't lead in the right way, I'm going to lose him. Where is he? I'm going to lose him. Because as a boy child, father, I grew up very, friends, I grew up stern. My parents, my family members, come on, you all know Jamaicans. <laughs> we hit first, we spank your bottom first, then we talk to you. And sometimes we talk while we spank. <laughs> you know exactly what I'm talking about. And you dare not make a mistake when they give you instructions. Even if it's the first time you're doing the thing. You get a conk in your head. A slap in your head back. Now, some are going to say, Pastor, that's your Jamaican, but not our upbringing. But that's how it is for most folks from the Caribbean, right? Right, friends? We hit first and speak after. And sometimes there's no speaking. So I grew up rough. And tough, right? I must get this boy in line. Why? If I don't do it, the general penitentiary will. The correctional facilities will. And they cannot correct. Only Jesus can correct. Do you see it now, friends? So now I say, I must just use the rod. The rod, but no duty. Come on. Stern duty has a what? twin sister which is uh, kindness if duty and kindness are what blended decided advantage will be gained amen to that friend amen. because it's jesus in us that's why when they when they make mistakes don't whip them sit them down and pray with them and he can tell you sometimes after prayer no more whipping just forget about the whipping why? The prayer has softened his heart and my heart. But sometimes after prayer, <laughs> duty and kindness, friends. And that's why, listen, that's why, that's why many of our children have left the church. Do you know why? The parents have been 
on balance on either extreme. Just duty, but no kindness. The child becomes more rebellious. Sister White's friend, Sister White has to be inspired. She says, if you don't pray with them before you correct them, if they need the rod of correction, then you give it to them. If you don't pray, why you try to drive out of them one demon? You put in 10 demons with your anger. So that child grows up rebellious still. On the other hand, if you don't have duty and standard, but just kindness. You see what I'm saying, friends? Then you spoil your children. They become unruly. They become disrespectful to their parents. And guess what? In turn, they disrespect Jesus. Jesus is love and is he firm. His law is he love. Oh, friends, I need Jesus. How about you, friends? And as we go forward, we have to give the world this combination. Law and kindness. That's why Jude says, uh, on some, having compassion. Compassion will make the difference. Make the difference. And when I see Jesus, not only does he show me law, he show me love. He calls me, come my son. I will give you the kindness. I will give you my character. I want it. Do you want it, my friend? Do you want it? It's an appeal. Grab your family and come to the front. Hold your family. Come to the front. Let's all have a prayer of consecration right now. Right this minute. Because all of us should now see your need. We all should see your need. Duty, stern duty. That twin sister, kindness. We have to surrender, friends. We have to. We have to make it in. We have to be on that seventh step of that ladder. So now when you leave here today and you go home, you may very well see the very person or persons. You may hear from somebody who you have not yet forgiven. Guess what? See God's love in that. The only way you can demonstrate kindness and forgiveness is to be placed in a circumstance where you can now say, dear God, live out your life within me. Live out your life through me. And if you were to hold me accountable and never forgive me, I would not be saved. God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven me. God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. You must forgive. But you can't do it without whom? Talk to me. Without whom? Without Jesus. How often must you ask him then for strength? Daily. Give me this day my daily bread. And forgive me of my trespass as I forgive others. Be kind to me as I am kind to others. Heads are but eyes are closed. Father in heaven, even those online, join us in prayer. Safe to serve international. Join us. Father in heaven,